everyone. Welcome to our panel discussion, Resetting the Future, a deep dive into Forward PMX's 2021 Trends Report with Stagwell and MDC. I'm your moderator, Deirdre McGlashan, the Chief Media Officer at MDC, and I'm joined by a group of four amazing colleagues. I've got James Townsend, Global CEO of Forward PMX, Julia Hammond, President, MDC Partners, Dan Gardner, CEO of Code and Theory, and Ray Day, Vice Chair of Stagwell. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. So let's start by talking about last year. Last year, think about, think back to the last mass event you went to. For me, it was CES. And I'll be honest, it's hard to imagine doing that now. We've all kind of gotten used to attending conferences, doing webinars like this one, talking to our colleagues and our families across the world in little boxes on a screen. It feels kind of weird to see someone in person these days. We've also had our eyes open to social injustice, some of the social injustice around the world. And we're also at a critical juncture when it comes to climate change. And so we've experienced all of these things collectively and globally, probably for the first time in history, having this global, this global experience, maybe in different phases. Last month, Forward PMX released Resetting the Fu for, for the Future, their annual trends report, exploring the driving forces behind um, that drive business and, and marketers in the digital age. So before we ask the panelists to talk about the trends that they are each will be covering, I'd like JT to talk about the report itself. How was, the, was put a, pulling together this report this year? Was it different from other years? Yeah, hi. Thanks very much, Deirdre, and thanks for everyone for joining. Um, yeah, it was different. Um, I think, you know, we've produced this uh, twice now, and the first the first report was sort of forged in the, the flames of, of the pandemic as it began. And um, what we found there was we ended up producing a report which was sort of unapologetically tactical and was all about sort of excellent execution in digital media and marketing, you know, helping clients protect and grow um, through a crisis. Um, and what we found this year was there was a real opportunity to think about how we can look to the future uh, as the world reopens as the vaccination program uh, progresses and think perhaps more strategically and more uh, methodically about how you know we provide sustainable growth and, a, and an accelerated digital economy. Um, so you know we went around the world and we, we, we engaged all of our offices over 30 offices uh, across APAC, across MENA, across Europe and, and obviously North America. Um, we worked in partnership with the Harris Poll who did a fantastic job talking to consumers in all of those markets. Um, and also we spoke to clients, you know, and as, as, as well the platform. So, you know, a broad church of opinions, uh, a broad church of agendas. Um, and really what we see is a collection of trends which we think will endure. But as you rightly say, against the kind of context which is genuinely global. I think last year taught us that, um, you know, we are a global community and certainly a business ecosystem that is global. Um, and every aspect of the supply chain through to the marketing department and, and everything in between was connected last year. And we certainly sort of felt that in... In, in the pandemic. And so this is really about five trends that can help set um, a, a brand organization, a business, a product or service business on a course to continue to navigate uncharted waters, but to do so with some enduring trends that we think won't, won't go away any, anyway soon. And I'll, and I'll be talking personally about, about data and the legislation changes we're seeing in the privacy, uh, in the privacy world, you know, driven by consumers, not platforms, it has to be noted. But I'm um, looking forward to talking about that with you. Yeah, I completely agree with I read your trends report. I also looked at those and thought these really apply to every market, whereas in previous years reading trends reports, you felt like these are applicable to these markets and these are applicable to these markets. So that's that's great. Um, Julia, can you talk to us about your topic? Um, sure. Thank you, Deirdre. Oh, gosh. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Deirdre. Um, so uh, so I'm, I was brought to the party to, to talk about the trend um, examining uh, global and local. And um, I think a couple of the key things that we'll be talking about today is how you, it's not good enough anymore to just have a localization strategy, right? You can't just have content online that feels local. It has to be authentic. It has to be nuanced. It actually has to be per, feel, feel personal and resonant um, with, with consumers because the expectations have just become heightened on, on what personalization means, especially as brands go to market. So um, I'm excited to dig in with you and, um, and happy to examine that trend as, as deep as you'd like to go. Fantastic, thanks. Dan, can you tell us a bit about yours? Yeah, so I'm gonna talk a bit about connected commerce. I mean, obviously we all know that there's been a massive transformation in e-commerce and 
I think underpinning e-commerce, the root of it is really digital transformation. And I think digital transformation, those two words have been put together for years and it's almost been a buzzword. And I think there's been a lack of understanding, you know, that it isn't just about shifting media bu budgets. It's not just about making, you know, having an e-commerce online store. It's really about understanding consumer expectations and those behavioral shifts. Clearly, obviously in the last year, there's been a lot of this, understanding the different seismic things that are happening, how technology is an underpinning can rethink the products and services of the business, obviously how you reprioritize the marketing and remake the organization, everything from the roles and the talent, the governance, all of that is the underpinning to get to a place where you can have connected commerce. Because connected commerce is, is the ability to, to understand who a consumer is, regardless of the touch point that they enter and convert on. Great, thank you. And Ray, can you talk about yours, please? Yeah, absolutely. And great to be with all of you and great to be with the panelists. And I think as we talk about digital transformation and uh, change in consumer behavior and commerce, one of the things that we've seen in the last year that comes out in the trends report, but in every piece of data that we look at is shifting back to really caring about reputation. And really a redefinition of reputation is all about. So when we have a digitally transformed company or consumer, we have different consumer behaviors. Well, what does that mean? And I think the bottom line that we're seeing is number one, you know, a third or more of a company's capitalization is due to reputation. So number one, we have to care about it, but two, reputation means a lot more today and it's a more complex topic than it was just five years ago. It's no longer enough to master the marketplace with high quality products and services. A strong company that has a strong reputation or a strong leader that is revered in today's world also needs to serve society. And that's what we'll talk about today. Thank you, I completely agree. And I'm really excited about that part. So let's jump into the panel. And to the audience, if you have any questions, we'll be doing an audience Q&A at the end. So please pop them into the Q&A as you think about them as the panelists are speaking. So Dan, we're gonna start with connected commerce. As you said, it's no longer enough just to have one part of your journey locked up and perfect. It's really about connecting all of those. So what are the biggest pain points in connecting the different parts in today's ecosystem? Because it is very fragmented and there's more ways that consumers can get to brands than we've ever seen before. Yeah, I think it, look at the highest level, I think there's three buckets uh, the pain points fall into. First, companies just don't have the proper technology and data infrastructure to solve the problems. At baseline, technology is an enabler to create those connections in efficient ways. And many organizations are a bit behind the eight ball and be able to have that infrastructure that enables that to happen. Second, organizations and brands mm -hmm typically look to solve it from a brand perspective versus a, a consumer perspective. You can read a lot about this in the trends report, but putting the consumer first across all the platforms is necessary to set up to solve the, pro uh, solve the problems or challenges or opportunities. And oftentimes brands are just not used to doing that. They're very used to thinking brand first, brand platform, building blocks and pushing downward versus sort of looking forward and kind of pulling it up into what, what, where the opportunities are. And third is an organizational problem. Often companies are siloed from an organization and they don't communicate effectively and, and are shared in, in the objectives and KPIs to be successful in connecting all the dots from traditional brick and mortar to, to uh, digital, different digital channels. So there's a cultural aspect that falls into that uh, silos around organization. The culture is just not set up for a true digital transformation change because roles and responsibilities do change. Yeah, and I think the culture part is the really is a vital, absolutely vital part that often gets overlooked because basically you're doing change management within a business in order to enable this connected journey for the consumer. Exactly, yeah. For the group, um, last year we saw a huge leap in online growth and the roles of online and offline really shifted. Nobody was driving traffic offline, for example, and into store, for example. Um, do you, how do you think those environments are going to coexist moving forward? Well, yeah, I'll, I'll first kind of take a stab at that. I, I think the reality is um, there's one cohesive thing that happens whether you're in physical and digital, and that's uh, a mobile first strategy. 
that is the connected tissue to how you engage even in today's uh, you know, social isolated world or how you engage even in a connected world where you meet within a physical real estate brick and mortar and whatnot. And the reality is consumers have known about, have, have been acting this way even pre-COVID. Brands have been a bit slow to catch up to the fact that that is the cohesive connection. So I think there's a natural step up that can create meaning as people want to have a physical relationship uh, with their brands and, and people with, within context to the brands. And I think the mobile phone is really the connecting piece that allows that to happen in what has happened the last year and looking further back and where the opportunities in the future are. I think to build on that, I mean, I think one of the things that the consequences of last year was it, it sort of democratized our whole sector, right? You know, there were businesses that hadn't had the opportunity to go direct to consumer because of their relationships with big box retailers or third party retailers. And, and as those retailers um, became unable to provide a route to market, you know, it allowed it allowed businesses to go direct and to do that without any tension with their very important customers. And so I think what happens coming out of this is a much more equal and much more customer centric environment uh, because now the consumer has a choice as to where they access their product from. And it forces good competition, you know, positive competition. Big box re retailers are going to have to add more value experientially. Um, consumers might be pushing for con uh, you know, convenience over, over that experience. And, and there's a sort of healthy tension there, I think, that, that we'll see play out uh, more prevalently coming out of COVID. Yeah, I agree. And I think the other thing is the role of online and offline are changing significantly as well. So what is the role of the store and how does it intersect with consumers from an experiential standpoint versus how it is online to give every, everything a purpose? So JT, let's pivot the conversation to data. Data sure. privacy. It's yeah. never been more friend of mind or top of newspaper <laughs> than it has right now. I mean, we've regulations like GDPR and CCPA have been around for a while, but right now, Google and Apple are developing their own solutions in response to consumer demands. So, what are the advertisers' biggest challenges right now, particularly, you know, with the with the impending death of the cookie? Sure. Well, I think I think you make a good point, um, a point of distinction, actually, which is this is a this is a platform reaction to consumer demand uh, and to consumer pressure. And rightly so. Um, you know, when we did the work with the Harris poll, you know, 80 percent plus of Americans under 34 have changed their privacy settings in the last year. So this is absolutely something that is consumer driven. And I think what that provides is, is you know, a, a number of challenges, but also obviously a number of opportunities to to advertisers. I think the first point to make is that while the platforms have made their made their position clear in terms of the degradation of the cookie or the third party cookie, I should say. Um, it's unclear as the real nuances of each of the platform's behaviors in a, in a post cookie world. So I think there's a sort of a progress, not perfection approach that needs to be taken here, which is that, you know, it's absolutely clear and legitimate to say that it's a first party first world uh, is absolutely emerging. So a really rich one to one relationship, a permission based, a proactively permission based relationship with your consumers is going to be key. Uh, so getting on the front foot with that is absolutely necessary, um, especially if you're a business that has had a heavy retargeting strategy or who has been reliant on third party cookies. And I think from our perspective, you know, what will not change, what will not not be an opportunity for today, tomorrow, and, and, and in a post-cookie, post-third party cookie world, is that ability to have a richer, more nuanced, more, more contextual relationship um, with your customers direct. Um, so, you know, navigating those, um, those, those nuances, I think, as the platforms implement these changes is gonna be something to, to kind of watch out for and be agile with uh, as you plan and buy accordingly. I think the second part is, you know, we have to, and this is this is where I think it's a real opportunity for the market to improve. You know, third party cookies allowed us to be somewhat lazy, I think, on a bad day. And I think this creates an opportunity to be much more, you know, we're being forced to connect with consumers again, rather than targeting cookies or devices. And that that is a fundamental shift back into a healthier balance between positive use of data and technology uh, and connection points with consumers, but also the, the, good, the good best practice elements of, uh, of marketing, you know, and I think, we could see this wonderful balance if, if we get it right, which is, you know, perhaps a more state based approach to planning, a more contextual approach to how we, um, you know, where we place our brands and our businesses. And then also, you know, some really, really uh, a more, a more respectful role for true consumer insight and research. You know, I think about what Harris is doing. It's 
talking to consumers and asking real people real questions and getting real you know nuanced responses as opposed to uh, the practical information around a consumer so you know unclear waters connecting with consumers again uh, and real people and i think the third thing that's going to be a challenge is is measurement because as the platforms you know raise their walls um they will provide i'm sure excellent uh, tools to help report on the progress we're making on those platforms and how media dollars are performing and how work and creative work is connecting or not but of course there's going to be a requirement for objectivity uh be that an in-house team in a client's organization or, or an agency partner to be able to stitch all this together and make meaning of the whole view uh, and i think you know, digital promised us one view of the customer, and I think this will kind of slightly dislocate that. Um, and so there'll be a role for the ability to analyze and, and understand, you know, what's working, what needs to be refined, what can be improved. Um, so yeah, sort of three three areas, I think, but that's that I think was quite quite interesting to me, you know, 80% plus of Americans have proactively changed their, their settings. So I think this is a consumer demand that we have to then then respond to in kind, you know? Completely agree. And I think we also have the opportunity with this to, as you said, change our tactics and in a way, reset the way we do digital marketing. And I think it's a really exciting time. I know yeah. oftentimes it feels scary, but I think right now we were on the advent of something brand new and I think it will transform the way we market. Yeah, it's, a, it, it, you know, it forces high standards, it forces a value exchange, which is which is, a, which is something that will create a more sustainable relationship with your customers. Exactly, and it forces a brand story to be woven through, which is what Dan's been touching on when it comes to kind of the technology enabling that. Um, we, we talk a lot about first party data in this industry, a lot about first party data. So, but we also know it's clear that not all first party data is created equal. Can you talk a bit about that, particularly since you've been working so much with, uh, with first party data points from clients as well as within our tools. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's interesting. There's a, there's a, there's a paradox here or maybe a, maybe a contradiction, which is that whilst Americans are wanting more privacy and that's a global trend we see, it's not just in the US, there's also an expectation, 65% of Americans are expecting the experience to be more personalized um, than not in, in the future. So an increased, increasingly personalized and bespoke experience with a brand and less ability to know necessarily data points about them, um, which I think makes, you know, a distinction around kind of what, what first party is, 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 in, is in entirety. So first of all, I think we default to it being a, a collection of addresses, um, almost like a CRM view of first party data, as opposed to actually thinking about all the data that a business has access to in terms of um, making, you know, a bridge between the business agenda and the consumer's needs. And I think that ability to, to draw upon more than just CRM data is absolutely uh, essential in terms of how we view the world uh, in a post cookie world, certainly a post third party cookie world. And I think then that takes you to like, you know, what, what permission do you have with the audience you currently have? So an email address and an opt in to a newsletter is not really the context we're going to need and look for. Um, my eight year old daughter's just strolled in. Um, and really what we need to think about is, you know, a greater level of dimension, um, which is, you know, yes, we need to be able to have the practical information about a consumer, you know, where are they, how old are they, gender, but really the interesting information we want is their needs, their values, you know, to, to what something I'm sure Ray will talk about. So dimension is going to be important. So if we have that permission, um, I think we need to find a way of being able to stitch that together. You know, how do we bring um, that first party data together in a way that can scale, um, that can merge online, that can merge offline information sources uh, and put together segmentation strategies that mean you are delivering on that personalization, um, that, that sort of rightful consumer demand. Um, and then I think after that, you're sort of in a position where you're putting work out to the market. Um, you've got permission to do it. You've got some context. I think then how do you turn that into a predictive, you know, future facing um, scenario? And I think that's really about, again, being proactive, but it's, it's, it's sort of making sure there's a value exchange and there will need to be a value exchange. And I suspect, you know, tactics like, you know, I don't know promotions and loyalty programs will have to be employed to ensure that there is a genuine like, value exchange where consumers are giving up more information, but they see the benefit coming back to them with more and more relevant communications over time. So, um, yeah, I think it's fascinating that you've got this absolutely right for kind of pr protection of your own privacy whilst rats butting up against the same individual saying I want a better experience and rightly so. So how do we navigate that change? Well, it's a richer collection of first party data um, rather than uh, the practical element, practical information about, about customers and audiences. 
completely agree. And you kept using the word value exchange. And I think that's the most important thing. We have to be valuable to the consumer who's receiving this piece of marketing. If we are, they'll be receptive. If not, doesn't matter how good it is, they won't be receptive. So you're right. It's writing that fine balance of respecting their privacy but, and not creeping them out, but at the same time, delivering them the level of personalization that makes them feel connected to the brand. Absolutely. Julia, let's talk about global now. When we talk about understanding consumers online, a lot about it is kind of what James touched on, which is context, like where they are, time of day, where they are in an offline context, as well as an online context. So what have brands learned over last year when it comes to speaking to their audiences globally? Yeah, so um, I think, you know, I think what James, James, what JT was talking about was very much is, is it's consistent with what you're seeing at the local level is what you're seeing at the global level. I think one thing that we've learned as um, brands continue to expand into new markets is that it's a not a one size fits all approach, right? There is nuance, there is learning that needs to happen. But not only that, we need to get better at putting local insights more upstream into strategic processes. We need to figure out not just, you know, looking at all of the data that's available. The hardest thing for a client to do isn't to get access to data. Like data is everywhere. It's a commodity. But what do you do with it? How do you activate it? And what data actually matters becomes the most important. And oftentimes, if we don't have a real, truly locally nuanced point of view on what matters, then we miss the mark, we miss the opportunity, and we don't strike a, a relevant chord in the marketplace. So I think um, so. That's that's something that you know um, that clients have learned uh, when we've got to work remotely all around the world. We can actually kind of come together in different ways too that make more collaborative upstream conversations actually a bit easier. I mean, speaking personally, like from this experience having put together global pitch teams and working around the clock and not having to get on a plane in order to do it has actually been like, I feel like we've been able to get even more nuance and understanding of a local consumer baked into global strategies, right? So there's some pluses and minuses that have come along with this experience. But I think the way that we think about, about being global to local and local local to global has also shifted in the course of the last couple of months. There's just been a lot more empathy and understanding that's been shared in, in two-way directions. Completely agree. And I think a lot of that kind of getting more understanding, a lot of it is because we've had more time because we're not on a plane. So we've had more time to interact with people one-on-one. -on -one. And I think the second thing, as you said, it's that empathy. You know, we, we've all been working with dogs and cats and children and chickens running through and it's made, it's brought us all together and we've been able to get a lot of those, you know, stories. Well, I, yeah, I gotta tell you, like, I mean, there's something different about actually seeing into somebody's home and like, and you know, like, like James just had his eight year old, like infiltrate the room. Like how many times, have, like every people I work with know that like, at 4.30 on Tuesday, it's piano lesson time. Like everybody knows that because they hear the God awful piano music coming, right? There's this element of humanity that's just brought forward and it's put on display and it builds, it, it almost when working with clients, it creates this almost, it's a disarming, but a more personal, more human connection that, that gets created. And, and I think when you're, when you're working across markets, that level of humanity gets almost forgotten because you're in such formal corporate settings all the time. So it's been it's been interesting being in the homes of people from around the world all, all the time. Completely. I'm going to share a quick story about Julia. So when I first started talking to Julia about this role, my puppy started digging up a plant and I needed to correct her because it was just the moment I hadn't caught her yet. And so I took my pen and I threw it across the room at her. And Julia said, did you just throw a pen across the room at an animal? And that's when I knew this was the place for me. <laughs> Your friends for life after that. Absolutely. <laughs> so you talked about the importance of having local for capturing that ethos um, in, from the market you're talking to, but how do you scale that? How do you hit the right balance of local credibility and global cohesion, oftentimes on a budget? Yeah, I mean, 
it is bringing together, you know, we say it all the time here, it's bringing together talent and technology, right? It's having the people on the ground that don't necessarily have to belong to a two, 300 person agency, like in every single market in the world. It's about, like, and, and we've got a lot of companies inside of our house that has decentralized talent networks fused together by technology platforms that enable collaboration, enable workflow management, enable those conversations to happen in real time, regardless of what time it is. So companies need to either partner with, you know, agencies like us who can help enable that, or they need to build their own capability that allow for decentralized local nuance to inform content, to inform go-to-market planning, um, but do it in a way where it's not laborious. It can't be, you know, bureaucratic and, and, and overly developed. It has to be nimble. Um, otherwise, you'll miss your opportunities. So, you know, we've got our global affiliate network that we deliberately tap into when we need local market expertise at the turn, like at the, like, like on demand. Um, because we can move quicker when you've got discrete teams that are set up to be successful by using an infrastructure that we've spent time building. Absolutely. And using an infrastructure also allows you to chase the sun. That's right. It allows you to get more done in a 24 hour work day. Right. I was put that question also to the group when it comes to hitting that right balance. Does anyone have anything they want to add to that? Well, the, the thing I'll, I just add is that, um, you know, you know, even back to sort of the connect, how you how you connect commerce. Um, you know, I think the thing that gets forgotten, if you just think into a traditional world, you know, you put uh, you put your store in a certain location, you know, your brick and mortar, because you want to be where they are, and you hire people to speak the way in a way that will connect with the people that are coming to the store. I mean, it's very, it's it's literally that simple. So when you think about global and local and how you achieve that, and especially from a digital perspective, you have to achieve it just in a different way, but you still have to be at the place where they are, whether that's social channels or you know other maybe owned channels that, that they're passing through. And you have to speak in the way that will connect with them and, and make it feel personal. Um, and that's what happens offline. And it's really, the behavior is not different in a digital perspective. And obviously the different mechanisms to connect that, but that, that's really how you get local in a global perspective. You set the brand values, you set the culture, you set the products and services, you create the consistency that regardless of location, and then you figure out the attributes that make it unique to where you are and how you're delivering to that personal relationship with the consumer. I, 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 just to build on that, I think, you know, the other thing that happened last year is there's this opportunity for live learning across regions. And, and, and we certainly saw it in our business, um, perhaps an internal view, but, you know, COVID sort of begun in Asia, hit Europe, MENA, and then the US roughly in that order, roughly in that order. And so what we found is that our APAC team were reacting to this crisis first, and then sharing those learnings and throwing those learnings over their shoulders into the other regions. And what you found was like, you know, tactical plans and only in a positive sense, tactical plans are being deployed faster as a result of learning from, from our colleagues in Asia. And also, you know, the supply chain, majority of the world supply chain is coming out of China, it's coming out of Asia. And so knowing when um, factories are being disrupted, products are being disrupted, we have, being able to have that sort of uh, local insight sort of on the ground and then have that shared very quickly, very digitally, I think, made us a faster organization, made us able to react better. So I think, again, internally, it's um, the ability to learn live and then push that around the world has also been a hu huge benefit for us as a business, certainly. Yeah, and I agree that is a benefit just because everything is accelerating and everything will continue to accelerate. So being able to do that and hopefully we'll be able to take the lessons as we all start to re-enter back into the workplace and take the lessons from the markets that are more ahead of us. Uh, we have a question now from NRG, though we're just going to bring them up on the screen, please. Hey everybody, uh, thank you to today's panel. Really appreciate the insights uh, so far. Um, you know, uh, I'm Chris Rutherford, I'm Chief Strategy Officer for National Research Group. Uh, in the entertainment space in the last 12 months, we really saw a, a massive acceleration of a trend that had been building in the streaming space towards identifying and curating local content. It was really capable of breaking out and connecting with a larger global audience. Um, local interdisciplinary partnerships were really 
playing a key role here and continue to do so. What are the key elements of cultivating and managing successful partnerships and what should brands be on the lookout for? Well, I'll, 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 tell you, I'll jump in. I think in terms of cultivating successful partnerships, uh, in my experience, it's always been the most successful partnerships are when two brands bring together their own values to make something that is unique to the combination of the two. And so by doing that, you're, you're elevating both brands, you're giving uh, both brands a platform to play. Sometimes one brand is leveraging the coolness of another, one might be leveraging the product security of another. But by creating those joint, um, joint brand collaborations, if they are unique, the products become inseparable in a consumer's mind. So it's not just a brand times brand, but it's something that's truly unique to the market, to the brand that's being marketed. And you're like, oh yeah, of course I remember that. That was so-and-so because who else could it have been? Because it fits so well with their brand values and their brand architecture. That's what I found in my experience in terms of successful partnerships. Yeah, the one, the one thing I'll add to that is, you know, brand partnerships in some way is influencer strategy on steroids, because what you're having here is two active audiences that are engaged and believe in the brand. So in some ways it's, it's I like to say it's the new 30 second spot because a 30 second spot in a traditional matter is how you get one to many in a very effective way. And influencer on steroids is because typically brands have bigger audiences than just you know micro influencers or influencers. So it allows you to get to that one to many mass reach in still a way that actually is in a digital first kind of how you make that relationship very tight with a brand. And obviously the brands need to make sense and the products or services that are combining, uh, that's the table stake there. But when done correctly, you're getting two passionate audiences at real large reach. Yeah, that's a great build. Thanks, Dan, because you're right. Everything we do, we are trying to do at scale to be able to reach our largest, our largest target audience. Thank you, Chris. And now we're going to move to Ray. So part of what Julia was talking about when it comes to global and local is really about developing a positive brand reputation on a micro and macro scale. So with this in mind, how should brands navigate the challenges of addressing or responding to events or issues that take on national or international importance? We saw a lot of that last year. Yeah, uh, first I'm, I'm gonna push back a little bit on your question. I, I find this a lot that people use the term brand reputation. It's a pet peeve of mine, but I think it's a really strategic pet peeve. There is brand and there is reputation. The two work in harmony but the best organizations know how to work both. And what I mean by that is you build a brand, but you earn a reputation. And you have to, from a business standpoint, an organizational standpoint, a communication standpoint, a marketing standpoint, you have to realize that you need focus on both. Building a brand is all about building desire, differentiation, motivating people to buy your product or pay a premium for your product. Reputation is really the sum of everyone's perceptions about your company. It's your license to operate. So just every time I hear the word brand reputation, I stop people and I try to do my own little education. The best organizations realize that one relates to the other. And if you work both of them, the bottom line benefits. Now, in terms of your, your real question, before I give you the, uh, the academic lecture, was really about, well, what are we seeing in reputation during the last year? And what are we seeing in terms of issues? And all the data we look at, including the, the data that we're talking about today and other data that the Harris Poll has been doing, the biggest aha moment is that business is being viewed more highly than ever, certainly in the last decade. And with that, being put on that pedestal means there's more expectation. And I'll just give you two data points. When we went through the Great Recession, 2008, 2009 time period, business was viewed as part of the problem and perhaps the problem. And the reputation of every single business sector declined. Today, business is viewed as either part of the solution or the solution, and government is the Achilles heel right now. And so we are seeing more emphasis than ever on 
consumers, key opinion leaders, whomever it is, looking to business to solve problems. And that's why we more and more, whether we're in the marketing side, the comm side, whether we're leading in the C-suite, we're being faced with things that we never had to deal with before. We're being faced with, do we wade into politics? Do we wade into societal issues? And my advice to everyone is number one, there is no longer a safe zone. A lot of us have grown up through the years and we focused in business on here are our products, here are our services, we're gonna let the policymakers deal with everything else. That's the environment around us. There is no longer a safe zone. And what is really, really key today from all the data is that society expects us to have a point of view, to have a set of values and to act on our values. So I think the bottom line from what I've seen and from what we're seeing on how do you build purpose into your brand how do you protect reputation uh, in your business? It's, I've had a lot of conversations in the last year with marketing teams, communications teams that have spent days talking about, well, what should our company statement be about X societal issues? Or how should we advertise about Y societal issue? And the Harris Poll will be releasing its annual reputation results next week. And I've been going through the data. And what is clear to me, when I look at the top 10, the top 20, the top 25 companies, it really isn't about what they said, what they advertised. It's about what they did. And that's what society is looking for more than ever. Tell me about your actions. Don't, they're okay. Come out with a statement, come out with an ad, be supportive sign a pledge, but don't stop there. Marry it with your actions. And I think one of the things that a hypothesis I have is there's gonna be a great reckoning because there's been a lot of commitments, particularly in the last two years, a lot of pledges signed, you know, the business roundtable statements on purpose. Well, two years on, consumers, key opinion leaders, policymakers are asking, okay, what have you done? You signed up for that, tell me what you've done. And I think that's why we're seeing so much focus today on purpose, on reputation, on the ESG discussion in terms of financial investment. People want to hear about actions and they want to see actions and they want to see results. Completely agree. And people are asking very vocally for that as well. Absolutely. And so when you think about, and thank you for correcting me, now I know, brand health corporate reputation. I'll never get those two mixed up again. <laughs> star for you. Thank you. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's really clear that this reputation building needs to, to live within every component of a marketing strategy to be successful. So reflecting on what the others have said today about global, local, commerce, connectivity, how can brands leverage marketing moments to build their reputation and strengthen their corporate purpose? Well, I think kind of two truths. One is we don't live in a world where it's one size fits all. We probably never lived in a one size fits all world, but today it's not only not one size fits all, but it's more divisive than ever. And we have to, as we're developing our marketing plans, as we're developing our communications plans, we need to remember that we need to communicate with a suite. And you know, this whole discussion that Julia was talking about and that Dan and everyone were talking about, it's really moving from macro to micro, more personalized than ever. And I think to build on what Julia was saying about the importance of local and tying that from a reputation standpoint, in every measure that we've done, local everything has more trust than we've seen since we've been tracking reputation. So local leaders, local governments, local news media, local institutions, they have about a 10 point gain on trust than anything happening at the national level. So when you step back and you think about that, kind of the two truths for me is one, there isn't one size fits all. We live in a very divisive society. And I just think about you know, the question of, do we speak out on issues? Well, in the US, for example, to give you one data point, if you talk to boomers, they say, no, that is death. Do not do that. You talk to young people and black Americans, they say, we're gonna either avoid you or maybe even boycott you 
if you don't speak out, you don't take a stand and you don't start to have a point of view on issues. So you've got this, it's all about balance right now. How do you create strategies and plans that create a balance across the spectrum? And then from a local standpoint, just from my standpoint, looking at reputation, I think having global centralized standards, a point of view, a brand value, company values are more important than ever, but local execution has never been higher. And again, trust is the watchword of reputation. And when I look at companies that are faltering on reputation, it's usually the biggest watchword is trust. And again, trust the data and a 10 point gain and everything locally, just make sure that you have a national campaign, but also you are looking at things locally to build that balance of trust and reputation. That makes sense. Thank you, Ray. Um, we have a question now from F and B. Uh, can we bring them up on screen, please? Hey guys, uh, I, I'm Tom Suharto. I run strategy at uh, FMB in New York. And I did have a question for you. Uh, super interesting conversation and, and thank you for your time. Um, you know, it's clear as, as your report kind of calls out and as you mentioned, there kind of being no safe zone that it isn't so much a question of if you need to have a point of view, but how to, to execute and sort of deliver that point of view authentically. Um, and we see this reflected in a lot of our briefs, like a lot of the challenges that clients are giving us is how to respond um, and how to integrate purpose into their marketing. I think a lot of times in the past, these could have been things that were CSR related, or as you mentioned, like ESG related, um, that are now sort of like really baked into brand campaigns, baked into, you know, CMO initiatives. Um, and, you know, I think a lot, also a lot of that pressure is being driven by uh, DTC brands that are kind of coming in, just upping the market. Their fit between brand, product, and purpose is like just a lot more effortless um, than a lot of these established brands. And, you know, as these briefs come in, the bars, the bar for them is getting higher. It's not just about education. It's about engagement. It's, it's a, a higher creative bar, um, earned attention. So I, I really like your notes around action to build trust, but my question is, um, is sort of like what advice you would have for established brands who are looking to more purposefully integrate purpose uh, into, into their marketing efforts to compete with these more disruptive DTC competitors? Yeah, two pieces of advice and great question, Tom. Um, and my first piece of advice is, and it's advice I give to C-suite leaders and marketers and communicators right and left, and they ask that question, everyone's asking that question, how do we know, and you touched on authenticity. Authenticity is the key watchword when you're discussing purpose, when you're discussing speaking out. And what I always like to have people first do is ask yourself, what are our values? What are our values as an organization, as an institution, as a group of people, whatever it is you're talking about, what are our values? And for most larger companies, they have established values and they're well articulated and make sure that you always start with what your values are as a company. And I have found that if you have a discussion around your company, your business, your organizational values as a start, these decisions about do we take a stand on that or do we have any authenticity? Do people even care or think we have, we should have a point of view on that. Well, it goes back to our values. And what is it that drives us internally? And you know, company I was at um, one time ago, we were, the, the, we were having a big debate about the immigration policy in the US. And we had a discussion about our values. And the fact that we have signs on the wall that say you should be able to bring your full self, your diverse self, and you should feel comfortable every day of the week at this tech company. And then we looked at the immigration policies and said, yes, we have, a, we have an obligation because we have signs on the wall. We have employees in our midst every day of the week saying, okay, this company has that sign on the wall. Are they gonna live that? Or are they just gonna you know, pull up in our company and not speak out publicly? So we came out very aggressively. And then in terms of 
you know, how do you as an established, as an incumbent company, face off against the shiny new toys? And the advice I always love to give people, and it was advice I was given very early on working for a hundred year old company, an incumbent company was be the best company that made you be alive for a hundred years. Be the best, and in my case, be the best Ford Motor Company that you can be. Don't try to chase the shiny new toys. They're gonna be the best at what they do, but what made you great, what made you king of the hill at one point will make you great going forward. So be the best at what you've been, be the best at what you are, and don't chase others' value propositions and don't chase other people's whys. And if you do that, you will deliver and you will win. I have one one just kind of distillation because like I think Ray did a really thoughtful response, but then also just a slight build. So like one point I'd like to make is uh, purpose isn't a marketing effort. And that's exactly what Ray is saying. It's inherent to the company. It's how do you behave as an organization and how do you bring that into the core of not just what you do every day, but how you do it every single day. Because your purpose is your why, right? Like the reason why these, you know, direct to consumer startups are so successful at activating a purpose is because it's inherent to who they are and how they've come to market. So like, you can't just, you can't force it. You can't, you have to actually be willing to have those hard conversations with your clients and say like, will you die for this? Will you like, is this like, will you fall on your sword for this purpose? Like, does your company fall apart without it? Because if the answer is no, then it's a marketing effort. It's not a deep purpose. And that's when things fall flat. That's when, when consumers, you know, smell a fraud in the room. Yeah, you know, as well, it makes me think, you know, I don't think many businesses were set up in a cynical way, right? If you're an established business and you've been successful for many years, um, it wasn't set up in cynicism. It was set up because there was a need and then that need was sort of nourished over time. I think, you know, you look at Unilever, like the second biggest CPG business in the, in the world, you know, it's set up to provide, you know, affordable nutrition to, to the working classes. You know, I think where brands struggle, established brands sometimes struggle is they've moved away from that core proposition, maybe not, not Unilever, but just as an example. Um, and being sort of true to the, what is it, the, the founders, the founders sort of vision for what they're going to be, I think to, to raise point about the best possible, uh, you know, um, transportation company you could possibly ever be, um, or, or CPG company, what were you kind of there, you provide, provide affordable food to, to millions of people, that's an honourable exercise, and I think, you know, somewhat somewhat looking back to the sort of founding principles of those established businesses sometimes give you clues to to what might be something to revisit or or, or plant back right in the heart of the company product brand marketing etc yeah, I, I was going to add just one more build because i think it's a good question to, to what everybody's saying is that you know it can't just be marketing actually relates to marketing in general the problem with marketing is is just what you're saying and if you think about a digital first perspective and a connected experience, it's what you do. It's not just the values you put on the wall, but it's how you're gonna live those values. It's not just, you, you have, there's a service level to everything you do. So when you think about consumer behaviors, what are they doing and what are you going to do for them? And it's not just what you're gonna say or what you say, how good you say your company is or how good you say your brand is. When you get to authenticity, it's what you're doing, not what you're saying. And when you think about marketing, marketing has to now connect to what you're doing, not just what you're saying. Tom, that was the best question, I think, of the day. You got all the panelists involved in that one. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot. Now we're going to take some of the Q&A from the audience. And thank you, guys. You guys have been quite active in the Q&A. There is a um, question that's come up a couple of times. I'm going to start with that one uh, a couple of times in different variations. So the question is, has the global landscape changed pre versus post pandemic? Are there some markets that have really exploded or are there more, some markets that are more similar than they've ever been before? Uh, I'll, I'll start. I mean, I think, you know, last year was more a catalyst necessarily than a sort of revolution, I think. And I think what we saw is the fast growth economies of the world adapt faster, adopt 
digital uh, and technology um, from a cultural perspective, from a consumer perspective, sort of faster than, 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 than maybe the more mature market. So, you know, when we look at our MENA business, it grew by 100% last year and, and our business model only works if our clients are growing. You know, uh, there's, a, there's a sort of first generation um, and, and, a, and a young population in both MENA and APAC, certainly China, um, the absolutely a digital first, mobile first, to Dan's point. And I think what that meant was there was a relatively frictionless shift from, you know, a hybrid world where there was virtual and real world uh, choices to, to make around where you access your brands and products to an entirely digital, you know, uh, uh, and, and web-based world. So I think we saw the fast growth economies of the world um, and the fact that they're probably, uh, I don't want to get shot down for this, probably more advanced in the social platforms, the search platforms, the fact that they're actually hybrids now. Um, that I think sort of meant that brands, businesses and consumers all changed sort of probably a little faster than maybe the Western world, the more mature markets, more established markets, you might say. Um, but, but I think that's what we saw, certainly. Um, and it's fair to say that those markets also changed very quickly as well. I completely agree. And I think the digitization of all markets, I think we're just going to see that accelerate in what we used to think of as emerging or developing countries because they're coming in, you know, wireless first as well. And so they don't have that old infrastructure we all had to grow up and grow through Absolutely. with Absolutely. our own, you know, in the West preconceived prejudices as we moved from technology to technology. You know, who, I, mean, who, I can't who, believe it took a, Sorry. Yeah. Who knew, who knew the pandemic was the thing that was going to actually bring the QR code out of Asia? Into, that is into exactly Europe. what I was going to say. <laughs> 20 years. Sorry. Sorry. But it's, it's getting right. crazy to me. Right. And like, uh, look, at, look at mobile payment. Look at mobile payment in certain markets, like in Latin America specifically, like where you've seen such a tremendous growth because people don't want to handle cash anymore. It's like it's like the 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 sheer behaviors that have been accelerated have just been in isolation, they seem very small, but when you aggregate them together and you see like grocery delivery in the US, like, I'm sorry, but that's not gonna go back to the way it was before. It's just not. Like there's so many of those things that continue to, to just be seen in pockets. And together, it makes like massive changes all across the world in so many different ways. And Dan, I know you and I have talked before and love your perspective, but I think it's not just a geographic discussion, it's a sector discussion. And Dan and I have often talked about in the last year than the great equalizer uh, of industries. There are some that entered pre-COVID in a much different space. There were the leaders and the laggards. And I mean, Dan, I won't put words in your mouth, but you know, just take a look at the education system. What has the education system learned from some of the digital leaders in the last year alone? Yeah, I mean, obviously I, I agree with that. I mean, and you could take that even, even further now, and obviously there's a lot of hoopla around cryptocurrency, but if you think about the democratization, what's happened with mobile phones, mobile payments is what Julia said, and then you add decentralized finance to it, it really creates an equilibrium on how consumers can um, change th their circumstance and obviously how industries, every industry has to change to basically, you, ca they, you can't just rest on your laurels anymore. That doesn't exist. Not one industry is not affected. Even the way government communicates uh, with its citizens, education obviously is the other one, but auto, obviously there's gonna be massive transformation that's gonna continue to happen because of this, no industry untouched. Completely agree. I think we're going to stay kind of on that theme of, well, I'm going to jump back to you, Dan, because we're going to um, go back to connected commerce. One of the questions is thinking about the intersection of connected commerce and the data conversation JT was having, what are some of the tactics that brands can, uh, should think of using the physical spaces to collect data in the same way they do online? Yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting now is, you know, what made digital so successful from conversion is the data. It's, it's how do you create an interaction? It's not about just what's going out. And I, obviously I talked about messaging is more just what you say, but what you do. But the always the beautiful trick is if you put something out, what are you getting back? And I think when you think about connected commerce, even within a, in a physical brick and mortar, there's now an opportunity to not only put something out, but actually learn about that and get something back to how to retarget or recommunicate or create that personalized experience. Uh, I think um, uh, James mentioned something, you know, moving from cookie, a cookie relationship to a consumer relationship. And I think there's a real opportunity and data plays a, plays a massive role in that. So I think, you know, 
One challenge is as the as the industry, and I'll get to sort of the tactical second in a second, but as the industry has pivoted um, to e-commerce, there's been such a race to focus everything on conversion. Everything went to how do we convert, convert better? But the problem with that is there was a lost opportunity on service. Again, I go back to the brick and mortar, there was a service level. And I think about when you think about grounding tactics to collect data, you have to give a service level that will allow someone to engage in a way that obviously you can create a reciprocal opportunity to collect data. Obviously there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, technology and AR is like the obvious thing that you clearly AR is a natural, uh, opportunity where you could be in, uh, in in somewhere and do something fun. The idea of service chat, you know, bots in general or service chats that can connect, that doesn't necessarily mean it is only a service chat in a digital landscape. There could be opportunities where you're uh, a company that actually has distributed retail and you've never had the opportunity to have that one-to-one -one communication. And now you can, you can understand what they're doing and help them and guide through and see what they're, how that's converting and not converting in different ways. So I think there's a lot of different digital tactics actually out there. Um, I think the technology is far uh, actually better than the uses right now, because we're as we're now coming back and we've now invested in digital infrastructure in the last year and we focus mainly on transactional, I think we're going to start to see the opportunity about how we convert that into more of a service level connection that happens in a, phys a physical environment that allows a collection of data. Because again, digital allows one thing comes out, one thing comes back. So um, I'm excited about what's to come in the next couple of years around that. That's great. I'm glad you keep stressing that service level because it really is about that value exchange. I mean, we can talk about cookies and IDs till the cows come home, but basically we are each our own highest fidelity ID. And so if you give people a reason to engage, a reward for that engagement, be it utility or entertainment, they will. And that's better than trying to sneakily track people around, or, you know, kind of around the world wide web with the shoe they may have looked at three weeks ago. Exactly. Value. It, it all comes down to value and value isn't just the product it's it's the the service and attributes around it completely well we are coming to a close now so i'd like to wrap up by having each of you guys just leave the audience with one parting thought either about your trend or just uh, the future in general so jt i'm going to start with you um okay parting thought well i think you know the context today i think is that you know last year demonstrated we're a global community and a global sort of business business community certainly um, but I think with the changes around us it's it's progress not perfection right it's like you know there's the world around us is not going to stop moving there are no static points consumers are changing your own business is changing uh, the platforms are changing um, and legislation is changing so I think we we see these trends as enduring and enduringly useful um, but what we totally acknowledge is the world around us is going to keep changing and moving so on that basis it's about a progressive mindset make tomorrow better than today uh, and make your business a little bit better and your service to dan's point uh, to your consumers a little bit better um, than it was yesterday and, and and your business will become commensurately and sustainably uh momentum based and we think that's that's that would be my parting thought today progress not perfection progress not perfection i like that jt julia i'm going to toss it to you um, well, I think um, if I had one thing, it would be uh, companies need to have a smarter approach to skill. Um, fusing together talent through technology um, has to be at the center of anyone's uh, expansion strategy. Otherwise, uh, they're going to pay dearly for it. So. That's a great one. Dan, I'll put it over to you. I'll keep it simple. You know, I think often the confusion is that digital capability means digital transformation, and that's not exactly the same. Just putting, changing your touch points into digital touch points and putting content uh, online um, and, and doing some social media and making a website, that's not digital transformation. Digital transformation sits within across the company from the organization to obviously the platforms and the touch points and the services. Great, thank you. And Ray, finally to you. I think if there's one thing the last year has taught us or should have taught us is that change is happening at warp speed. You just look uh, 15 months ago and look at how the world has been changed, how the consumer has been changed. And I think for us as business people, business leaders, the lesson to take out of that is we need to stop so much quarterly think, today think, this week think, and be far more future focused. The question I often like to ask myself and teams around me is, 
Stop focusing just on what we need to do this month. Ask more about what the world is going to be like a year from now, three years from now, five years from now, and start placing some bets and making the changes proactively and be far more proactive and future focused. Thank you, Ray. And I think the parting thought for me is to bring together everything you guys have talked about. I think brands really need to know themselves. They need to know what their brand values are and how they would and their brand behaviors. Because I think that makes choices easier as you navigate this complex world. And I think it helps Dan and the team better as they sew together consumer experiences for the brand. So thank you everyone. And thank you for joining us today on this webinar. Have a great afternoon, morning, night, wherever you are. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very Bye. much. Thanks everyone.